Hello, my name is Johannes Unterguckenberger from the Institute of Visual Computing and Human-Centered Technology at TU Wien, Austria, and I present our paper Conservative Meshlet Bounds for Robust Culling of Skinned Meshes, which was accepted to Pacific Graphics 2021. Just recently, technologies like Epix Nanite were presented, which subdivide static geometry into small clusters in order to enable fine-grained culling. We believe that the high geometric detail of such solutions for static geometry shall not remain limited to static meshes, so we present a technique which enables fine-grained and robust culling for animated models of similar geometric detail. Our solution targets skinned animated models with an underlying skeleton, which is a bone hierarchy and therefore applies bone transformations in a hierarchical manner. The vertices of such animated models constitute the skin, like in the case of our virtual character here. Skinned vertices are assigned to one or multiple bones in a weighted manner and move according to the underlying bone hierarchy. And for our target application, we are dividing the vertices into small clusters, which we call meshlets. A meshlet is a small cluster of geometry, which is a small patch of the original mesh's vertices and indices. New shader stages, which were introduced in 2018 as part of NVIDIA's Turing microarchitecture, enable efficient processing of such small clusters, given that they obey certain defined limits. The new task and mesh shader stages are to be used within rasterization-based graphics pipelines. However, in contrast to classical pipelines, only the rasterizer stage remains as a fixed function stage. All geometry processing shader stages are replaced by the new task and mesh shader stages. They enable efficient processing of multiple meshlets in parallel. Entire meshlets can be culled very early in such a pipeline, namely in task shaders, so that unnecessary computations are avoided in later shader stages. However, when culling meshlets of animated models in particular, care must be taken, because rendering artifacts like those shown on the slide can occur easily. What we see at the borders of the screen are artifacts from premature view frustum culling. Meshlets that were distorted during animation were wrongfully deemed to be view frustum cullable, producing a false positive in terms of culling and leading to holes in the rendered result. The same type of artifact can be observed at the other side of the screen. And further artifacts can be seen here, which are marked in magenta. These are false positives from the backface culling algorithm. In our paper, we describe a technique which avoids such artifacts. It is able to avoid both types, those from premature view frustum culling and those from premature backface culling, and enables robust culling, meaning that no artifacts will be visible when using it. What we require for achieving that are conservative bounds per meshlet, namely both for its spatial extents under animation which is indicated by the bounding box on the slide, and also for its normals distribution under animation, which is indicated by the cone on the slide. It represents a conservative estimate of all possible normals that can emerge for this particular meshlet under animation. Let us take a look behind the scenes when rendering animated meshlets. I will activate the animation of the skinned 3D models in a second, but during the animation, please remember the following. For the whole duration of the video recording, the frustum planes and the camera position that are used for making the culling decision are fixed to the position and orientation you see right now. That means, as soon as I start the video, keep in mind that the frustum planes just remain as if viewed from this perspective. The 3D models, all of which have been divided into meshlets, have started to animate, and soon we will get a look behind the scenes. We can already see view frustum culling in action. From this perspective, we can see that most meshlets have been view frustum culled that are pretty close to the frustum planes. 
but there are also some meshlets further away from the Thruston planes, for which the conservative bounds ended up being relatively large, and because we do not want to have foils positively called meshlets, these must still be rendered to maintain robust results. I will now let the video continue, and you can identify some well-behaved meshlets and some not so well-behaved meshlets, which have larger bounds and are therefore not culled as the observer camera moves through the scene. And as the observer camera turns around, we see the effect of backface culling in action, which is performed based on the conservative normals distribution that we have computed per meshlet. I will now give a brief description about how we compute these conservative bounds per meshlet. Let us see what happens to our meshlet here under animation. We animate the vertices that are assigned to it through bone animation, just like we would classically compute it. Let's observe what happens to the shape of our meshlet. We can see that the meshlet's shape has changed. And this is a problem for culling, because also its bounds have changed. Here we are in the initial position once again, and we create a bounding box around all vertices in that initial position, and we also compute the distribution of its normals. If we transform once again, we can see that the initial bounding box fails to encompass some of the transformed vertex positions. And we can imagine that the changed vertex positions also changed the face orientations, so that the initial normals distribution might be insufficient at this animation state as well. This is the explanation for why we saw those rendering artifacts on the previous slides. Only by computing meshlet bounds, which also encompass all transformed vertex positions and normal directions, we can avoid such artifacts. Our algorithm for computing meshlet bounds works in two steps, where first the conservative bounds of all vertices are calculated and then those vertex bounds are combined into common bounds for the entire meshlet. So we create one point sized bounding box at animation time 0 for each vertex and extend all these vertex bounding boxes to encompass all positions along the way when animating to animation time 1. You can see that the vertex bounding boxes have been extended according to the transformation. Each one of them now is a conservative representation of all positions between the two animation times, which could refer to two subsequent keyframes of an animation. In our algorithm's second step, the meshlet's bounds are computed by taking the minimum and maximum coordinates of each vertex bounding box. What we can also compute from the vertex bounding boxes is a conservative normals distribution, which is computed from all possible extreme positions of faces, which could possibly emerge based on the bounding boxes of a faces associated vertices. Now we have a bounding box and a normals distribution for our meshlet, which represents all possible positions and all possible normals between this animation state and our initial animation state. There is another important aspect of our algorithm, namely the choice of space which we store a meshlet's bounds in. World space or mesh space would be bad choices, since these would lead to unnecessarily large bounds. Instead, the bounds should be stored in the space of the bone which has the highest influence on the vertices that are assigned to the meshlet. In this case, the bone marked in dark blue has been deemed to be the most influential bone by summing all its associated vertices' weights and comparing it to the other bones. Let us create an initial bounding box in this bone's space. We can see that the initial bounding box is now axis aligned with that most influential bone's space. So after having computed the initial bounds, we are going to transform the initial bounding box along with the transformations of that most influential bone during all future animations. So from this initial state, we transform into the animation state at animation time 1 once again. And we also have transformed our initial bounding box along with the movement of the bone it is assigned to. 
What we do now is computing such bounding boxes and normals distributions for all animation intervals of interest and we remember the maximum bounds along the way. This is the bounding box that represents all possible positions and extents between animation times 0 and 1. Let us now create the same thing for a different animation interval between animation times 1 and 2. Let's assume the following is the animated position at animation time 2. And we have everything transformed into the space of the most influential bone for this animation state. We can see that the bounds need to be extended a bit to also encompass all positions in this state. And we proceed and take another animation interval into account. In this case, our bounding box was already sufficiently large to encompass all positions of this animation state. Now the nice thing about computing only one bounding box and also on only one normals distribution cone per meshlet is that we can use them very efficiently in a task and mesh shader enabled graphics pipeline. We just need to store one bounding box and one normals distribution cone per meshlet. That leads to rather simple culling code in task shaders and therefore low overhead of the added culling code overall. In fact, culling in task shaders pays off even more for animated meshes when compared to static meshes, because not culling them incurs a higher penalty due to the skinning code that is executed per vertex. We compute these bounds per meshlet in a pre-computation step. And the interesting thing about our pre-computation step is that it can be used as an adaptive pre-computation step. So consider the following. We might not want to render all meshlets with culling enabled pipelines if, for example, we were unable to find a normals distribution which does not span the whole sphere of directions. Or if the resulting bounding box ended up being so big that the small, but still, overhead of the added culling code is not worth the cost. In such cases, we could decide to just render those meshlets which are not well behaved, so to say, with pipelines that do not include culling code. So let us assume that this meshlet was identified as not being well behaved. This decision was based on analysis of the animation intervals stated on the slide. And what we can do now, using our adaptive pre-computation step, is to consider smaller animation sub-intervals. So instead of computing conservative bounds for the whole animation time interval between 0 and 1, for example, we can split that interval in half and analyze our quality requirements for each sub-interval. The conservative bounds for the meshlet are guaranteed to be smaller or equal to those of the original interval. And if this subdivision was not successful in identifying our meshlet as being well behaved, we can subdivide again and analyze even smaller sub-intervals. In this example, we determined after two subdivisions that our meshlet indeed fulfills our quality requirements and we decide to render it with culling enabled pipelines because we have found that it has reasonable bounds. Using such an adaptive subdivision strategy, we can trade pre-computation effort for better runtime performance while in all cases the results are conservative. In our tests, we were able to identify for different 3D models that usually 94% of meshlets or more are at least suitable for view frustum culling with the quality criteria that their bounds do not grow more than threefold compared to their initial bounds. And with regard to backface culling, around 60 to 90% of meshlets have ended up with usable normal distributions, which deviate at most by 30 degrees from a mean normal direction, while this percentage can be increased with additional computational effort in the pre computation step. We discuss all of these in detail in our paper, where we also describe our vertex bounds algorithm in detail, which requires the bone hierarchy to be traversed step by step towards the most influential bone. And bounds are extended conservatively in each step. While conservative extension of translation and scaling transformations is straightforward, we had to develop a solution for extending the rotations, which is based on a derivative of Rodriguez rotation formula. 
This formula describes how a vector can be rotated in space given an axis of rotation and an angle. Quaternion rotations can be converted to and from this representation. Our derivative solves the following problem. Consider a vector that is rotated with the bone which makes the following movement. According to that bone movement, the vertex moves approximately like follows. If we only took the start and end positions of its rotation path into account, we wouldn't get conservative bounds of the transformation, because the extrema can be found along the way. In our paper, we describe how a conservative axis island bounding box can be computed for such situations by using a derivative of Rodriguez rotation formula. It is able to find the extreme extents like for example shown here for the x-coordinates. Furthermore, we describe how vertex bounds can be combined to be usable with linear blend skinning. We describe our algorithm for computing conservative normal bounds per meshlet. And we present and discuss our results and show classification percentages. The positive effect of culling on render times can be observed in our results. The chart on the left hand side shows that render times without culling, the blue bars, are significantly higher than those when culling is enabled and in action. The dark bars show render times of pipelines with both backface culling and view frustum culling enabled, which led to significant render time reductions. In particular, if 40% of meshlets were culled, render times have been reduced by almost 34% in one of the tests, which is currently highlighted on the slide. That means that the actual render time reductions are pretty close to the theoretically maximum reductions of 40% corresponding to the number of meshlets actually culled. In a different test, an even higher render time reduction of more than 35% was achieved. Results look pretty similar on a different GPU of a newer generation. Also in this case, render time reductions are close to the theoretical maximum. We hope to have contributed to achieving even higher geometric details for real-time rendering solutions of the future by presenting a robust culling technique based on conservative mesh dead bounds, which is now also available for skinned meshes. Thank you for your attention.